Welcome everyone to the Rook Talk on storage for Kubernetes. I'm Travis Nielsen I'm with the IBM storage team. I'm one of the original creators of, of Rook, one of the maintainers. Uh, it's been a, a great journey. We created the project, announced that it's already been seven years, so happy to be here with you again today. It's a little a bit different size of conference now since uh, Seattle where we announced it when there were only a few hundred people at KubeCon, imagine uh, that far back. But yep, happy to be here, um, Annette. Yeah, hi, I'm Annette Kluid. Um work with Travis and met Travis about five years ago. At that time I was uh, doing Kubernetes and storage and uh, Travis gave me a, a demo and I was all in on Rook after that. So I've been doing that with Travis and others, in particular uh, disaster recovery right now. So I'll go over that later, thanks. Mm -hmm. Dimitri? Uh, I'm Dmitry Mishin. I'm at the University of California, San Diego, San Diego Supercomputer Center, and we've been using Rook since the almost beginning of uh, Rook. We're still using it a lot, uh, and I will talk uh, about our use case and uh, how we are excited about uh, the capabilities Rook provides. Thanks. All right. So what, what are we going to talk about today? So I'm going to start us off by talking about, well, what is Rook? Uh, and talk a little bit about why would you use it, why do you need storage. I think we heard a bit this morning about, uh, in the keynotes, you know, why data is important. We all know why data is important. We need to protect it. Um, then Dimitri will talk to us about how he's using uh, Rook in uh, the National Research Platform, give us some background, show us his topology about how he's deployed it. It's an interesting use case of how Rook is really used in production in large scales. And then Annette will finish up with some application disaster recovery, talk about these scenarios for how to protect your applications across multiple uh, data centers, multiple regions. Uh, just to get an idea of who's in our audience today, I'd love to know, you know who are, who's here to learn about Rook for the first time? All right, we've got a good crowd. Uh, who's heard of Ceph before? Most of you, okay. Uh, how many have experimented with Rook before? Okay, good crowd also. And have you deployed in Rook in production? A lot of you also. Okay, thank you for that background. Uh, so let's go through this quickly, what, what Rook is. Um, originally when we were starting with Rook, even before we took a bet on Kubernetes, we were looking at cloud native storage. What do we do for storage? Um, what about storage in your own data center? If you're running in a cloud provider, there are options there. You've got you know, AWS has its solutions, Google Cloud, Azure, they all have their cloud solutions. But what about your own data center? What do you do? Um, and then if we need storage for Kubernetes, how do we plug it in? Uh, Kubernetes has traditionally treated storage as an external thing. Oh, we'll just worry about stateless applications. It's just an external problem for storage. But why not manage storage with Kubernetes applications? Why does it have to be separate? Why not uh, treat it as any other Kubernetes application? So as we started our journey, we were looking at what storage platform should we trust? I didn't work for the Ceph team at the time. Um, you know, it, it was an independent viewpoint. We wanted to choose a platform that enterprises trusted. We didn't want to build a new storage platform because we know data is a, it, it's a hard problem. And so we made the decision to build on Ceph. Ceph has been inter, uh, production ready uh, for many years already. Uh, but back to Rook, so what Rook is then, Rook is making storage available in your cluster. So we, we looked at Ceph, we said it wasn't built for Kubernetes, let's bring Ceph to Kubernetes. Uh, we created an operator, operator with custom resource definitions to define how you want to deploy Rook, how you want to deploy storage, and then Rook will take over the rest. We'll automate the deployment, configuration, upgrades, and allow your apps then to consume the storage uh, just like any other storage application. Now we use storage classes, persistent volume claims, all these other uh, terms that you're familiar with in Kubernetes. Um, Rook, from the start, we wanted to make sure it was open source, that we do the right thing for the community. Uh, so that is one of the basic principles, open source and open to, open to contributions. Well then what is Ceph? So what did we love about Ceph that made us really want to choose it? Well, Ceph, from the, from the get-go, is a distributed software-defined storage solution, and it provides all three common types of storage. So block, uh, which is used for read-write once volumes, um, shared file systems with read-write many volumes, so you, need to sh you have several pods, several applications, or multiple instances of applications that need to share the same volume. 
You can use the shared file system with ZFS. And then if you need an object store, if you're not running in the cloud um, or don't have access to the cloud, you want your own cloud with object store, you've got access to S3 buckets locally with Ceph as well. Uh, more information on the Ceph website, ceph.io. And another thing we loved about Ceph was it's also purely open source and available for contributions. Uh, it has a, a proven history with enterprise adoption and first release back in July 2012, so 11, over 11 years ago, and a great story with CERN's uh, large collider, um, where, yeah, just huge data processing needs that's, that they're using Ceph for. Ceph itself is designed to be consistent. It's not eventually consistent, but once you commit your data, you know it's, it's committed and replicated. Uh, Ceph has a great architecture for replication ac across uh, different AZs or whatever topologies you have, racks, nodes, disks. We can take your storage and in the topology you have and create the storage platform. That replication is configurable. How many replicas do you want? And it's proven highly durable. Even in extreme disasters, data can be recovered uh, with you know, troubleshooting guides. So what does this look like as we brought it together in Rook? Uh, so architecturally, we really have three layers to think about. So Rook being the, the management layer. So as the operator uh, with the CRDs, you can tell us how to configure Ceph, and then Rook manages it. Then the plugin layer is with CSI. You know, C, there's CSI plugins for any of the storage platforms. C, Ceph CSI will manage that provisioning and that mounting of the storage to your application pods. And then once your data is provisioned and mounted under the covers, Ceph provides the pure data layer. At the end of the day, Ceph doesn't even know it's running in Kubernetes, it's just uh, providing that data layer and, as if it were running outside of, outside of Kubernetes. But it's all running together, or it can all run together, or it can run separately. Uh, moving on, how do you install Rook? Uh, there's multiple ways. You can use Helm charts. Uh, we also have example manifests for all sorts of different configurations. There's, there's many ways you can choose if you want to run the three platforms, block file and object, or just one or um, multiple combinations of them. You can get started on Rook.io. Uh, now, where can you run Rook? So anywhere Kubernetes runs, that's our goal to run uh, storage. So whether you're in the cloud or on-prem, there are, you know, if you're on-prem, you have this need for storage, clearly. That's where we started the project. But users have even found in the cloud uses for Rook to have that consistent uh, platform for various reasons. Uh, you can do it virtual or bare metal hardware. The underlying storage can also be node-attached devices or PVs from the cloud uh, or loopback devices for testing. And then Rook really helps enable cross-cloud support, so to have that consistent data platform to run uh, across, in your own data center or in any cloud. We have a mode where you can run Ceph externally. So essentially, the CSI driver, you configure it to just connect to Ceph that you've already got running outside of your cluster. Uh, so you don't, have to, you don't have to redeploy it inside Kubernetes. And then one feature I'll just mention that's under active development, object storage provisioning. Uh, with the Kubernetes community, we're working through the container object storage interface, which is for provisioning buckets with object storage. We do have that implemented in the latest release. And we're in experimental mode, happy to hear your feedback. And until that's more stable, we do have the object bucket claims, which we've been using for several years already to provide that bucket provisioning. So a little about the project and the health of the community. So really our philosophy has always been community first. We want to know what the community wants for storage and we wanna again make sure it stays open source. We have maintainers across four companies currently with Cybosu, IBM, Red Hat, and Core and Upbound. Um, I'm with the Ceph team, Annette and I are with the Ceph team. We moved from Red Hat to IBM just with acquisition, uh, things going on. but. Yeah, it's all the same Ceph team and, and Rook working together. We've had over 400 contributors to the GitHub project, and just this week we hit the milestone of 300 million container downloads. So kind of exciting. 
Rook did graduate uh, three years ago, October 2020, with the CNCF. So it's just a, a testament to how much the community appreciates that openness and that community first approach and running in production uh, for, for a long time now. A uh, little bit about that journey. So three years since graduation, five years since we declared it stable for production, and then seven years since we announced it. Uh, just so many people running upstream. We'd, we never even know how many people are running it upstream. Always love to hear your stories um, about that. And there are several companies with downstream products around it as well that we're not going to talk about today. But release cycle, so upstream, when do we release? We, we kind of shoot for about every four months, similar to the Kubernetes cycle. 1.12 was in July. 1.13, just with holidays and things coming up, kind of moved to early December. A little over four months in, in this case. But we do have regular patch releases uh, where we shoot for biweekly. Unless there's a critical need, then we can, we can uh, ship that as soon as we need. Just our CI processes, we try and keep those streamlined so we can release whenever needed. And now we'll pass the torch off to Dimitri for the National Research Platform. Hello. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk about our uh, use case for Rook. Uh, so I'm a part of the team of National Research Platform. A National Research Platform is a NSF-funded project that's providing uh, compute resources to scientists from more than 50 institutions. Uh, mostly in the US, but we also have collaborators from Europe and Asia. Uh, and it's based on uh, San Diego, uh, University of California, San Diego. So the project started uh, from a pro project called PRP, Pacific Research Platform. It was mostly measuring network performance between uh, universities. Um, so they are connected with 10 to 100 gigabit networks, and it was making sure that you really get uh, the network performance you're expecting. Uh, but we put Kubernetes on those nodes um, to just uh, uh, handle them uh, more easily, and that's how the Nautilus cluster was born. So Nautilus, in this case, is the name of the cluster, of Kubernetes cluster, not the version of Ceph. Uh, eventually, uh, last year, uh, the project evolved into national research platform, so that's uh, NSF testbed for the national infrastructure for uh, computations. And uh, what it does is uh, it allows uh, di different universities to attach their nodes to a single cluster. And uh, also we provide all those resources for free to scientists who have uh, research projects. Uh, that makes it a global uh, Kubernetes cluster. As I said, we have uh, nodes in US, uh, Europe, Asia, uh, Africa is not covered yet. And all nodes are connected with 10 to 100 gigabit science DMZ. So no firewalls, jumbo frames, uh, very well connected, all monitored. And uh, because we are pr providing compute resources and uh, we need uh, persistent storage. And we were using Rook from the beginning uh, for all uh, persistent storage needs in our cluster. Uh, currently, it includes uh, six local and regional uh, Ceph clusters inside one Kubernetes cluster. I will uh, talk about them more. And because uh, Kubernetes provides uh, connectivity between all nodes, so each node sees every other node as a next hub, uh, all nodes around the world can mount any uh, Ceph pool, which is pretty cool. Uh, if you mount from far away, you get less performance, but it's possible to mount. We don't have problem that you need to move data first and then uh, do your computation. So research and providers can add their own resources, uh, which means they tell us, hey, I have this node connected to Science DMZ. Uh, they provide uh, maintenance, power, cooling, uh, networking. If something breaks, we are expecting that they fix the hardware. So it's remote hands, but we take it uh, from there and we install operating system. We manage uh, all the software on it and node becomes the part of the cluster and gets all monitoring and gets the jobs from users. And optionally, they can request that uh, they get preferential access to their own hardware. But it's not required for to uh, use our uh, computer resources. Scientists can just come and say, hey, I want to run in your cluster. They, they are more than welcome to. 
uh, so it takes five minutes from uh, the node with Ubuntu installed to become the part of the cluster with just Tensible Playbook. Uh, this is a map of GPUs distribution around the US. Uh, so we are covering a lot of apps core institutions and minority serving institutions. And uh, most GPUs currently we have are in California and uh, West Coast, uh, but we have a good representation in Central States and East Coast. So cluster is constantly growing. We are adding a couple nodes per month. And currently we have uh, 19,000 uh, CPU cores, 1,200 GPUs of different generations from oldest 1080 Ti's to newest A100's and so on. And a map of uh, Ceph storage. So currently uh, it's five petabytes, uh, again scattered across uh, US in uh, six Ceph pools. And uh, it's covering uh, many regional uh, networks. Uh, Scenic is providing a network in California, and all the internet too is covering uh, most of the years. And so everything is very well connected with fast networks. A uh, map of our nodes. Uh, again, as I said, California is historically the biggest one. Uh, we have uh, many nodes in central states. So this is showing uh, memory CPU and GPU uh, with the size of the uh, dot and uh, number of nodes. Uh, so also we have three nodes in Europe uh, and I think five nodes in uh, Pacific region. And uh, most nodes in California are uh, bought by NSF grants and uh, other nodes um, par partially uh, just donated by different universities, partially uh, also purchased by the uh, NRP project. So this is the distribution of uh, sizes, uh, capacity and usage of our SEF clusters. Uh, first one is the largest, it's historically just called Rook, but that's uh, Western uh, Ceph pool. Uh, this is showing uh, two petabytes. Uh, this week we added another petabyte to it, so now it's actually three petabytes. And it's uh, 1.5 petabytes used. Uh, that was, was after uh, heavy purging, so we had some capacity issues in that, and th that's the most uh, used pool by users. Uh, second one is Eastern, uh, that's covering uh, New York, New Jersey, uh, Delaware. Uh, that's uh, usage is growing now and it's one petabyte uh, of capacity. Next one is central states, uh, also close to one petabyte and 600 terabytes used. Uh, southeast uh, Florida, uh, it's, it's uh, our newest one, so it's not used uh, much yet, but uh, again, usage is growing. Uh, then Pacific, uh, almost 400 terabytes. And the last one is uh, the smallest uh, local for UCSD, that's NVMe only. So all other uh, pools are uh, spinning drives with N uh, database on NVMe. And yellow is uh, above 70% uh, used. So this is our dashboard for uh, our largest uh, Western pool. So as I said, it's uh, above three uh, petabytes right now, 1.7 petabytes used. Uh, we usually see uh, between five and uh, 10,000 uh, IOPS. Uh, it's picking up to 15,000 IOPS sometimes, and uh, the pool can deliver up to 10 uh, gigabytes per second. So we're trying to keep all the pools uh, below 10 millisecond range between nodes, uh, just because uh, that's the requirement of Ceph and that makes the pool faster. But uh, users, as I said, can mount it from uh, far and uh, Ceph is caching the data. And so uh, they get less performance, but it's still usable even if you mount across US. Uh, we also experiment with other storages in our cluster. Um, so this is the diagram of all uh, storage in, uh, in the cluster. Uh, first one, the biggest, is uh, Western. Uh, then we have three uh, 
OSG uh, Open Science Grid Origins, uh, so that's the project uh, working with CERN on high energy physics uh, mostly. And those are just three nodes with petabyte of storage attached and uh, using XRD and stash caches to access that data. So that's uh, three uh, next three uh, petabytes. Then again, a uh, number of uh, Ceph and Rook uh, pools. And then uh, there are uh, Lean Store and CWDFS uh, storages. Those are small and uh, just used as the experiment and for uh, very um, small use cases. So majority of users are still using Rook and Ceph and that satisfies all the needs for users. Thank you, Dimitri. Hi, so I want to switch gears just a little bit here and talk about a, a solution I've been working on for the last couple of years, which is to take uh, Rook, which uh, orchestrates and manages Ceph, and combine it with a few other um, upstream projects to uh, automate application disaster recovery on um, Kubernetes. So what we're talking about is a situation that it could be a true actual disaster. Um, I was with a financial company when Sandy Hurricane hit New Jersey, New York, and the company I was with figured out they had way too many data centers in the circumference of that disaster. And some of the data centers were unavailable for months. So sometimes you can communicate when you have a disaster with what you need to, and sometimes you can't. So let me just sort of give you a, a, a visual. And this is, you know, regional is, um, or a region doesn't necessarily have to be that far away. But the main thing here is this solution is asynchronous. So we'll see that you're going to have some data loss, but you can sort of cap that data loss based on how often you move data from one region to the other. The, the applications. Um, the applications will only exist on one cluster at a time. So the data will be replicated in a, from one cluster to the other, but until you need to use the application on the opposite cluster, it doesn't exist. So you're not using resources or just waiting for a disaster. Both clusters can be used, but just on any one application only exists on one at a time. So, and again, disaster recovery, does, uh, resiliency is not a new concept. Um, it's been around for a long time. I think the difference with containerized platforms is we don't see a lot of it yet. <laughs> um, but as containerized platforms become more sort of critical, they are going to be required to have disaster recovery planning and resiliency. So we have two measures recovery point objective and recovery time objective. Again, not new. But what we want to do with containerized platforms is we want to get those down to minutes instead of days. Um, in the case of RPO, the, for an asynchronous replication, your replication uh, interval decides really how much data can be outstanding. So if you're replicating every five minutes, then you could lose up to five minutes of data. For RTO, even if you lose zero data, you're still going to probably have application downtime because you have to reinstall the application on the alternate cluster. So Rook um, has been really instrumental in helping the solution along. One of the, the Rook CRs or CRDs is a Ceph RVD mirror. So Ceph has and has had for quite a long time the ability to do mirroring, which is to do the replication between Ceph clusters. So this is not one cluster, this is two clusters, and we're replicating via like snapshot the data from one to another based on volumes or images. So um, that is coming out of Rook. And then out of the CSI add-ons, we have the volume replication CR and the volume replication class. And those are really important to the solution because volume replication is what we use to enable and disable mirroring. 
instead of having to do it with Ceph commands. And then volume replication class is going to have the interval of replication. So those two are coming again out of the CSI add-ons. So another thing that we need to have um, to be able to make the solution work, and this is coming again from CSI, we need a volume replication operator and we need an OMAP generator. So these are sidecars. If you've ever um, used or deployed Rook, you'll see that there's CSI um, pods that get created. One of them is called the RBD provisioner. That these two um, sidecars will become containers within that RBD provisioner. And you're, you can enable those if you're doing it manually um, via the config map for Rook Ceph. So if, if we're doing this again um, using Rook Ceph and using the capabilities there, we're going to be able to change the action of the volume replication so that it, it will go ahead and promote and demote. Um, actually, let me say that. You will be able to enable mirroring, and then what we'll be able to promote and, and demote storage will be the volume operator that we saw the CSI add on. So, I mean, if you think about it, if I have a volume that is using an image and that image is replicated over to an alternate cluster, I have to be able to demote the storage on one cluster if I have access and promote it on the other so that it can be used. So, application failover is using the, the custom resources I went through. There's one case that I think doesn't get enough attention, which is the, the second one, which is what if I just want to migrate the application to a different cluster because it's closer to the users or maybe I don't like the cluster I have is out of resources. So in that case, you can scale the application down, sync the replication, all the outstanding data, therefore your RPO is equal to zero. It does require, though, that both clusters are healthy for just doing a migration. In the case of disaster recovery, it doesn't require. One of the clusters could be, like I said, in the Sandy Hurricane and not communicating, and you'd still be able to recover on an alternate cluster. Because the image, the persistent data, is on the alternate cluster. So, what I want to now go to is sort of the solution part of this, which is how we can combine a couple of other um, open source projects. Open cluster management, I don't know if you've heard of it. Uh, it is in a CNCF process. Um, so, it, but what, what it's good at is application lifecycle in particular, deploying and scheduling apps if they are available on a Git source. So we can use Helm charts, we can use Customize, but basically this will allow you to schedule an application via OCM, and we're gonna combine that so that we can autom automate the creation of the application on the initial primary cluster, and then if needed, recreate it on a secondary cluster. Really important um, sort of glue for all this is the Raman DR project. That's the one I'm involved with. And we use OCM, we use all the custom resources that you saw, but in addition, there's some new uh, CRs that are coming out of this uh, project. And they are DR policy. And DR policy, everything that you do with this solution is in groups of two. So even if I had 100 Kubernetes clusters, I'm gonna divide them into 50 um, peers so each, each cluster has a failover cluster. So the DR policy defines which two clusters are gonna protect each other. The DR clusters then is um, sort of an outcome of that, which is what, what are the clusters? Those are cluster scoped custom resources. And then we have the DR placement control. It is going to be, an, it's going to Basically, the action, whether it be failover or a planned uh, maintenance uh, migration, it's going to define the action. And that will be 
It'll be on the hub cluster, which we'll see in a minute here, but it will define the action of what are we going to do. Another really important um, custom resource coming out of the Raman project is Volume Replication Group. So that is, that is actually created on what we call the Manage Cluster. And in that case, once a, a DR placement control is created, then a, an associated uh, Volume Replication Group is created on where the application actually lives. So we've seen this um, at the beginning here, but I just want to define a little bit more here. You see in the middle there the, the um, open cluster management. So this is going to take three Kubernetes clusters. One of them will be the hub, and that is why we don't need the clusters to be communicating, because the hub is actually where DR placement control is going to decide the action. So the, the, say the cluster on the left is no longer communicating. The app, say there's you know, 100 applications there. We can use the hub to actually move those applications or recreate those applications on the surviving cluster. And once the other cluster comes back online, we can move them back using like a planned migration. Uh, so it's really powerful the fact that you have the hub and open cluster management, remember, has deployed the application via a Git source so it knows how to redeploy the application once the storage is promoted on the alternate cluster. And there's some other things there that, that you can read, but the whole thing is we want low data loss and we're talking minutes and we want low uh, for the application to be able to be reinstalled. Uh, we want that to be as low as possible. Hmm. Just a minute. Okay. Let me. How do we put that back in? I think Sorry. I hit the wrong. Sorry. Okay. Okay. No, it's in some other mode. Okay. So what I want to do, if, if you're interested in this idea, um, the team I'm on just for our own, because you can, you know, three clusters is a little bit of a heavy kit, <laughs> especially if you have, you know, control nodes and compute nodes on, in every one of them. So we came up with a way to use um, a VM or a machine that you have that has uh, eight CPUs, 32 gigs, still you know, a heavy lift, but, and running some kind of Linux. We've been testing in Fedora. And with this, uh, you can go to the, the Raman uh, DR GitHub, go to the docs. Uh, I recently rewrote the, the quick start guide so that it hopefully um, there's not any missing steps. And then also I did a video that's in, uh, in blue there. But what's nice is it uses Minikube, and it sets up the entire environment. Let me just show you. Sets up this entire environment, uh, sets up the Ceph mirroring, creates the three clusters, um, sets up, in the middle there you see a, a S3 bucket. We use that, there's, the application can be redeployed, but what we absolutely have to make sure is the PV and PVC are using exactly the same name and the same definition. So what we do is we move that definition to an S3 bucket so that on the alternate cluster, it can get that data and make sure that's hooked up correctly. So feel free to um, try it yourself. And uh, once you, you know, and I, I think I showed it, but on here, it's once you get the, the prereqs done, like installing Podma and some other things, you can basically use the DRNV tool, do that start against that YAML file, creates the whole environment for you. So I think we're at questions. Thank you. Yes. Thanks, Dimitri and Annette. Um, and I think we're about out of time, but we'd love to you know, see you at the Rook booth in the Project Pavilion. It's way at the end next to the CNCF store. Uh, so we'll be there for a few hours this afternoon and then tomorrow. It's just for the first half of 
of the time in the booth area. But Yeah, but if there's uh, any burning questions that we could do here in a few minutes, if anybody has anything. No, one question? Okay. So I see, uh, I mean, in your slides, you have, you're replicating the volumes as well as replicating the S3 object storage systems. So just wondering, like, you know, what kind of consistency guarantees the system allows or does? Mm -hmm. I, I think you said in terms of, of consistency, right, or, or when you, is that what you asked about? Yeah, so yeah. data loss is one thing, but, like, having the volumes in inconsistent state or the storage? Well, I mean, yeah, so it'll be crash consistent, but it won't be application consistent. Like if you have a database, you could lose transactions. Okay. Yeah, it's using a snapshot technology, so it does a snapshot and then transfers the snapshot. I mean, you could possibly have hooks that would quest it, and we're working on looking at that, but it's, you know, the hooks are pretty much per application. Yeah, because the application can look at like a bunch of files, like a set of files, like application might need a bunch of, or set of files to be there in order to see it as consistent and sometimes. Yeah, I mean, right now we're using what we call declarative. So you declare it in a git source. So when you recreate the application, you know, it's all, it's declarative. We are looking at um, what we're calling imperative, which is something where the application is not in a git source, but you, you still want to use the same process, which maybe is more of what you're talking about. Yeah, sounds good. I'll, we'll catch up like that. All right, thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thanks, everyone. Again, feel free to come up for questions, or we'll be at the Rook booth. Okay, thank you.